1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 through 11. Continue in our series on the love series. If you haven't been here, I do encourage you to go back and check things out online. I, I think there's something here for us, for every one of us, uh, to internalize into our lives. It's very important how we love God, how we love others, how we define love, where we fall short in our definition of love, and how we act in life and how we enjoy life based on the love of God, not an arrow, selfish, self-centered love with strings attached, but an unconditional, sacrificial, agape love. Start with a story this morning. Celeste Sibley, a one-time columnist for the Atlanta Constitution, took her three children to a diner for breakfast one morning. It was crowded, and they had to take separate seats at the counter. Eight-year-old Mary was seated at the far end of the counter, and when her food was served, she called down to her mother in a loud voice, Mother, don't people say grace in this place? <laughs> a hush came over the entire diner before Miss Sibley could figure out what to say. The man at the counter said, Yes, we do, sister. You say it. And all the people at the counter bowed their heads. Mary bowed her head and a clear voice said, God is great. God is good. Let him thank us. Let us thank him for our food. I want to talk to you today about uh, an aspect of love and a relationship with God and with one another that, that cannot be overlooked, that is, that is so instrumental. In fact, I think it's talked about so often that we miss it, and that is to be a child of God, to be a child of God. It seems as though the older we get, the further we get away from being a child, when in reality, the older we get, the more we ought to be more like a child in certain ways, especially in our spiritual walks. All right, so having said that, let's look at the scripture. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, that sounds interesting, when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. We'll talk about that this morning. I think there's a, something here for each and every one of us that would uh, perhaps change our perspective on life if we actually took this truth and internalized it. We have a study at Sky Valley on Tuesday nights and here in Highlands at CBC Highlands on Wednesday nights where we take an in-depth look at the book of Acts, verse by verse. I'd encourage you to come. It's a fascinating thing. But there's a question that came up a couple weeks ago, and I think it bears repeating here this morning. If you could, in your mind, think of the single most influential people who have ever walked the face of the earth apart from Jesus Christ, who would make that list? Who are some of the most influential people that have ever walked the face of the earth? I asked that question of group after group, and here's some of the answers I got. Mother Teresa, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, Billy Graham, Einstein, Henry Ford, Sir Isaac Newton. The list could go on and on. But then I try to make a case that there's actually one person outside of Jesus Christ that is probably more influential and has influenced those leaders more than anyone else. In fact, I think this one person has influenced the most influence, in, influencing people on the face of the earth over history. And that man is the Apostle Paul. What does Billy Graham preach apart from the majority of the New Testament? What does Mother Teresa live out apart from the New Testament that Paul was involved with, carried along by the Holy Spirit? What does Martin Luther have without the writings of Paul? It's interesting, isn't it? What happened to this man? I don't think there's any one man who's ever lived, who's ever taken a breath that has done more of a 180 radical shift in one afternoon than any other person. Here's a man who swore out murderous threats against Jesus Christ one day and the next day is aggressively, courageously, fearlessly preaching the gospel that Jesus Christ has rose from the dead. How does he know? Because he met him. And because in meeting him, his life got totally uprooted. 
You're going to think I'm being facetious. I'm not being facetious. If you look at the context of the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, how mean he was, how unloving he was, how violent he was, how disgruntled he was, how bitter he was, it would, you would, and how zealous religiously he was. The only modern-day example I can think of that parallels Saul preaching the gospel, and I'm not kidding, is if you went to a Billy Graham crusade, you sat in the audience, and Billy Graham introduced a guest speaker who was coming to preach the gospel, and his name was Osama bin Laden. That's the dichotomy between Saul of Tarsus and the Apostle Paul. Something happened, excuse me, someone happened to that man. The person of the Holy Spirit. For him to say, love never fails, is a statement that is so power-packed and con taken in context that it's beyond our ability to calculate mentally. For him to say, love never fails, is evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you're Jewish or you're listening online or after the fact, I can tell you, as a Jew, I ask you, and, and respectfully ask you, explain to me what happened to this zealous Jew named Saul of Tarsus. There's but one explanation, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, love never fails. He doesn't say love always wins, because love doesn't compete for a, a loss and a win. Love never fails. Love always succeeds. Agape always succeeds. He goes on to say, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. The Corinthians were a very spiritual bunch. Well, at least they thought so. They had their false gods down the street. They had their shrine prostitutes. They had their, their spiritual gifts. But at the end of the day, they were incomplete. They were seeking, and this is going on today, no one's any different. We all seek on some level to be complete. We're all looking for something or someone to complete us. We're all looking for something or someone to fill a void or a bad place in our memory or our life or our consciousness that if we don't, we have to reconcile ourselves to the fact that we're incomplete and we have something we carry with us we won't let go. We are incomplete, and they were incomplete, and they, they, they based their life on the temporary, not the eternal. And he goes on to say, when these spiritual things are over with, hey, listen, when, when completeness comes, I hate to bother you with this, but you're not going to be complete until that day when your absence from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's completeness. In the meantime, enjoy your incompleteness, but seek to meet that incompleteness in Christ. It's the best advice I can give you. And then he says this, when I was a child, I talked like a child. In chapter 3 of Corinthians, he says this to them, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. We have to watch out for this. How many, how many are willing to admit sometimes they can be childish? Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hand, that was fairly childish of you. <laughs> I'm very childish of you. You, have to, you, want to, you want to go into time out? That's very childish. You actually sat in the sanctuary, and the pastor asked you, how many of you know when you act childish? And some of you didn't raise your hand. That was very childish. Well, the Corinthian church was childish. They lived according to the flesh. They're all about eros. They're all about self. It's like a two-year-old... Now, they're either terrific twos or terrible twos. I don't know. I can't get, depends on if the glass is half full or half empty. But I can tell you this, a young child, and I've, style, I've studied childhood development, children, young children are egocentric. And maybe there's a few people here that are egocentric, where they're in the center, the epicenter of the whole world, the whole cosmos. Sometimes we live that way. Sometimes we need that kind of attention. But he's, that's childishness. You and I are not called to be childish, we're called to be childlike. And there's a, there's a grand difference. If you can get a hold of childlikeness in life and in your spiritual walk, you're going to have fun as a Christian. If you won't let go of childish, as Paul's talking about, 
you're going to have a difficult time. It's going to be a struggle. It really comes down to that. Are you childish or childlike? Childish people tend to trade insults, call each other names, and they don't share. Sometimes we're childish. That's the facts, Jack. Robert Fulgham wrote in the Kansas City Times, most of what I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in the kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sandbox at nursery school. These are the things I learned. Share everything, play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you found them, clean up your own mess, don't take things that aren't yours, say you're sorry when you hurt somebody, and when you go out into the world, watch for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. This writer has captured part of what Jesus meant when he said, unless you become like little children, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Those grandchildren that have come into my life and those grandchildren that are in your life are the second, the first, not the first, but the second reminder, friend, to grow younger, to grow younger. God, knowing our need for a reminder in our 60s, 70s, and 80s, sends us these little creatures to remind us to grow down, to grow down and to have fun to get on the floor again and to play and to frolic and to be innocent and to love, to take people at their word. This is the Christian life. This is, this is what Jesus came for us to have, the childlikeness of walking in a company of our Abba Father. We say we're children of the king, we say we're the kids' kings, but we can't just say it, we have to live that. What does that look like? How does that happen? Well, I would say that it happens um, with, with one quality of being a childlike, childlike that I think is, is one of the most important things about being childlike, but I think in the, in, in the church, unfortunately, it's, it's like not that important. And it gets muddy, it gets muddy, but let me try to explain. Do you live your life, your Christian walk, with a sense of expectancy? Now, many of us will answer yes right then and there. But I want you to really think about it for a moment. I'll tell you a story. It's in the book of Acts. Peter is arrested by Herod. He's thrown into a prison, a dungeon, and he's handcuffed to two other people. And 16 people are sent to guard him, four teams of four. In the morning, rather than have scrambled eggs and ham, which he's now allowed to eat, he's going to be killed. It's the last night of his life. The church, it says in the book of Acts chapter 12, is praying fervently for Peter back at the house. Peter is laying there half-dressed. An angel saunters into the prison, uh, stirs Peter, and tells him to put some clothes on, the shackles come off of him, and they saunter out. They amble out of the prison past the guards. Peter doesn't really know if he's like in a dream. How many know this? And your third or fourth time up in the middle of the night. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? This is kind of like he's half there, half not. Can I get an amen, gentlemen? Amen. amen. Thank you. So he doesn't really know what's going on. He's like, is this a vision, a dream? I don't know, I'm kind of half awake. And then they walk outside the prison, they're walking down the street, and this iron door opens up, and they walk through it, and then he realizes, I'm outside the city. Hey, something's going on here. What is this? The angel, having done what the angel was supposed to do, kind of leaves Peter, and Peter finds himself standing there with no shackles on, coming to his senses, realizing that he's not going to die in the morning, that he is a free man. So he's trying to figure out, when he comes to himself, the Bible says he figures he's going to go to Mary's house to sort this out. So he goes to Mary's house, and he stands out at the outer door. Inside, these people are praying. I mean, they're praying on their face, they're on their knees, they're running around, they're carrying on, the paint's coming off the walls, they're praying up a storm for Peter's release. And one of the servants in the house, her name is Rhoda, this is Rhoda's claim to fame. She goes to the door, and she can hear Peter outside the door. And she freaks out. She goes back into the prayer meeting without opening the door. Peter's still standing out there. 
And she says to the people who are praying, hey, time out here. Hey, 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 Peter's at the door. The praying church, the fervently praying church, says, get out of here. You're out of your minds. You're out of your mind. Peter is standing at the front door, and they're praying for his release because they have a lack of expectancy. They're adult praying, not child praying. They're not believing the promises of God, the a, our yes and amen. They're not believing their Abba Father. They're praying to make themselves feel good. They're praying out of duty, but they're not praying with a childlike expectancy. People ask me all the time, why does God do these miraculous things in other countries, but not here in the United States as much? And I say, it's expectancy. When you're in the backwoods of India and someone has a snake bite, and you pray that they'll be healed because you can't get to the hospital in time. They expect God to do something. We see it as something that's gonna, an activity that's gonna take place till we can get them to a doctor. Expectancy. I'll tell you another story. I baptized a young man named Ryder. You saw him. This kid had so much faith, he, he thought he could walk on water and I couldn't baptize him. I had to bring him under the water it could have been the temperature, I don't know. <laughs> but the Stubblefield family went on a vacation recently. And they prayed prior to their departure to go to Florida. I'm sure I wasn't there, and I probably don't have all the details right. They prayed for God's safety and travel mercies and things such as that. And at the end of the prayer, a rider tagged something on. And Lord, help me catch a hammerhead. <laughs> what? The safe prayer, Lord, we're going to be going down 75, give us a little safety, get us over there, we're going to have a good time. And then here comes the hammerhead. Lord, bless us with a hammerhead. <laughs> there's a couple problems. Sort of a last minute vacation, and there was no time to rent a charter boat. Problem. <laughs> Riders expecting a hammerhead. What do we do? Well, you go to the pier every day, 9 to 12, 9 to 12, 9 to 12, 9 to 12. You let your fishing pole hang over the side of the pier, and you put a lure on there for a hammerhead. Despite the fact that the people on the pier said no one's caught a shark here in 10 years, and despite the fact that there's little to no reason why this little boy would catch a hammerhead shark off this pier. So on the last day of the vacation, after his grandfather, Steve, who took the offering this morning, is trying to think of ways to soften the blow. You know, son, maybe we can come back next time and rent a boat. And his response was, it's okay, Poppy. I'm having a good time. I'm, it's okay. All the while, the kid's believing for a hammerhead. <laughs> Childlike faith. So the last day comes, and the last minute of the last session on the pier comes, and no hammerhead. So they go back to the house only to realize that the extension that they sought on the vacation was actually granted because there was a cancellation. They can stay four more days, 9 to 12, 9 to 12, 9 to 12. Nine. <laughs> so on the last day, when that, when that rod bent in half, that little boy grabbed that rod, and his grandfather looked at him, and they're both startled, and he set that hook. And they wrestled that thing up. His grandfather, Steve, looked over the edge and saw a dorsal fin. What about that? When that hammerhead shark came over that railing, and that little boy started yelling, God did it, God did it. <laughs> there was an elder in this church that got took to school on how to have expectant faith. <laughs> Jesus put it this way, therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. I guess that goes for most anything in our life, saints. I guess that goes for a kidney. I guess that goes for whatever it is we have need of as children praying to an Abba Father. I think a lot of people pray, and it's good that we pray, 
But if it's a religious duty or if it's an activity that makes us feel good or if it's something we do because we feel like we're supposed to or if it's uh, in the absence of a relationship or it's void of any kind of expectancy, if it becomes a habitual type thing that doesn't have this, uh, what about a hammerhead, God? I'm, I'm starting to wonder, is it really worth doing? It seems almost childish to me to keep doing the same thing over and over and over and get no results. The childlikeness about it is that you begin to act as though the prayer is being answered as you pray it because you're a child of God. You're a king's kid. Expectancy. I remember when I was a, a little boy, I'd get up in the morning. Remember when summer was three months instead of two? I'd sit on that last day of class, I'd sit in that clock, and I'd watch that second clock. I remember every year, every grade, 29, 28, 27, 26. When that thing went to 3 o'clock, I was, I was out of there. It was summertime, man. Three months of fun, frolicking with my best friend, baseball, going in the woods, going to the waterfalls, doing whatever, whatever I wanted to do. Remember that? Remember that childlikeness, that innocence, that frivolity, that fun? I used to get up in the morning, I'd take three cereal boxes. When my mom wasn't looking, I'd, I'd pry them open a little bit, I'd stick my hand down there, I'd get the prize on the bottom, I'd sit down, I'd make a wall, I'd get behind the wall, I'd read the back of the cereal boxes and I'd plan my day. Baseball, we're gonna build a fort. We're gonna shoot arrows by the poplar trees. Me and my buddy are gonna go do this. We're gonna take his dog and we're gonna do that. That's a boy, man. Sometimes when I'm counseling with some of these couples in this church and I, I see him sitting on the couch, I listen to the man, and every now and again, you can see Dennis the Menace in there. <laughs> you can see a little boy come out. And you know what, guys? This is the truth. Wives are a sucker for that. They, can, they have no defense against that. When they see that little boy come out in you, they love it. To be that little boy is cute to them. When you're not a little boy, you're overweight and ugly. <laughs> I'm just telling you the way it is. And you may even smell. <laughs> Women like that little boy coming out in their burly man. We're trying to be burly men, they're looking for a little boy. We're trying to be know-it-alls, they're looking for someone who doesn't know what they're doing. They're looking for someone that holds their hand in the shopping center, just like the little boy did when, like their son did when they were growing up. Billy Graham said this, we can change the course of events if we go to our knees and believe in prayer. I thought about that quote. Why doesn't he just say we can change the course of events if we go to our knees in prayer, not believing prayer? Because there's a difference. There's a difference between prayer and believing prayer. There's a difference between praying for a hammerhead and forgetting you prayed it and looking for one every day as you pull up your line. Looking for the tip of that rod to bend in half. That's an expectant prayer. That's a childlike prayer. There's a difference between prayer and believing prayer. Paul goes on to say, I reasoned like a child. And boy, did he ever. Boy, did he ever. Had that big education, that fancy garb, that big title, that sweat, religious swagger, walking through people like he knows it all. He did reason like a child. He was a childish little brat is what he was. He says, when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. But I think we get it confused sometimes. We've made manhood and womanhood so sophisticated, so complex, so uppity that our little grandson not only couldn't, but wouldn't want to attain to such complexity. That we've become, careful now, hardened in our affection and our sharing and our playing with toys with other people, and we've become inwardly focused so much that no little boy would want such nonsense. He wants to play with Dennis the Menace. He wants someone to join in the adventure with him. That's the Christian life, friend. I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. To get up in the morning and to start your day realizing that you're on an adventure. You might play, you may not play baseball, but life's gonna be enjoyable. You're gonna laugh more. You're gonna cry less. You're gonna share your toys with other people. 
You're going to hold other people's hands. You're going to give hugs like little kids do. And you're going to live your life in such a way that the lost and dying world who's lit, wanting innocence again as their child, just to be innocent little boy again, where our life was simple, they can look at you and they can see that little boy and that little girl. How many women in this room this morning, in this sanctuary, at any point in your life would have said, I just wish I could go back to be that little innocent princess just for one more moment? When I said no and I waited and I had enough love and I didn't have to do anything to get any from any other person. We're longing for innocence again. We're longing as a nation for innocence again. And it's, it's, it's so far removed from us, we have generations that don't even know what it is anymore. Childlike, expectant faith. This is what you and I are called to. As we prepare to take Holy Communion this morning, I want you to think about the possibility that exists that we've, this six foot six guy needs to be three foot six more often. That we need to take it down a notch and believe God for what he said he would do when he said he would do it and find our manhood and our womanhood more in being like a child. We need more childlike men and childlike women, and we need fewer childish men and childish women. And we'll fluctuate from day to day. I understand that. But there's a hammerhead out there for you. There's a hammerhead out there for you. God did it. God did it. It's interesting. If you're here this morning and you never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there's two things that are, a couple things that are going on with you. So says the scripture. You're looking for completeness. Some place in your heart, in your life, in your mind, is a desire for satisfaction and fulfillment. And the things that we've tried to fill that space do not work. The only thing that fills that space is a childlike faith in Jesus Christ, who is your king, and you are his subject, and he is your Lord, and he looks out for you, and he protects you, and he knows what you need. And your greatest need is him. Your greatest need is his friendship, your identity in a relationship with him so that you with a childlike expectant faith can believe him for everything he said he would do in your life. And if you've never accepted him, it's tough to be an expectant child because it's tough to be an expectant child when you're in charge of your own life when you have the responsibility and the authority to dictate the coming and going of your own life, oh, and your own afterlife.